Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Liquid Brain. So today I want to talk about some recent advancements of deep learning in the field of bioinformatics. So the flow of the paper are mostly based on a paper I found in Frontier in Genetics, um, titled Recent Advance of Deep Learning in Bioinformatics and Computational Biology uh, by Tang ETL in 2019. But of course, I've added some of the extra material that I find is relevant for the explanation of a neural network, deep learning, as well as how certain neural network architecture is being um, structured as well how, and how is it applied in the field of bioinformatics basically. So first of all, what is deep learning? You know, we heard about artificial intelligence, we heard about machine learning, and we also know about deep learning. So I, I, think I found this very nice um, graph here from Wikipedia actually, uh, the definition between AI, machine learning, and deep learning. So artificial intelligence is any intelligence that could actually mimic human. So anything that can do anything that is clever, we call them, that is, okay, a computer can do some clever thing, we call them artificial intelligence. Uh, you give them a lot of materials and they learn, and the machines start to learn, that is what we call machine learning. So machine learning is a subset of an artificial intelligence. And then deep learning is a type of machine learning that involves multiple uh, layers of neural network or just have some black box that we don't really understand. So basically deep learning is just, you can imagine it's a neural network with a lot of layers that, uh, that perform a lot of calculations basically. Okay, so there are first of all three type of machine learning network for those that are new here. We have supervised uh, learning, which you have a ground truth with you. You have the data, you have the answer, you give the machine and they learn completely. So unsupervised learning is that you have the data, you have no answer, and you try to find an answer with machine learning algorithm. So that's unsupervised learning and that's reinforced learning. So reinforced learning, the best example will be uh, the AI that play a computer game. Uh, there's a goal such as scoring the highest score as possible, but there's no clear answer for every single step. There's no answer like I need to take step five at this moment, no. Uh, the similar with uh, the, the, what is that called? The, the, the alpha go, alpha zero, as well as alpha star, they're all reinforcement learning that just uh, ask to play game. So the only goal they're given is win the game. They're not given how to do so. Okay, so there are, of course, there are several um, neural network architecture in each I'm gonna go through one by one later. So there are, of course, um, um, several types of neural network architecture. There can be a, a simple feed-forward neural network where data go in one side, it goes out the other. You can have a convolutional neural network where the image gets scaled down to a smaller image before it feeds to a neural network. You can also have a re recurrent neural network where the network has a, have, a, have a memory of the previous step. So RNN is very useful for, let's say you want to forecast the weather. So the, the history of the weather data is very useful to forecast what's gonna to happen tomorrow. So that's part of the recurrent neural network. So convolutional neural network, I've done a video about that. You can end the tutorial together. You can go ahead and try to, uh, I'll link the description, the, uh, link the video in the video description down below. So it is basically just take an image file and try to scale the image down to extract certain features, such as a strong edge, such as in face detection, Detect the eye, detect the nose, and detect the mouth, and know that that is a face. So that can be done very efficiently through convolutional neural network. So what do they do in uh, bioinformatics? It's actually called DeepBind. So DeepBind is a program that is actually using CNN to detect, um, the, to predict, sorry, the sequence specificity of DNA and RNA binding protests uh, by deep learning. So what they do is actually using um, protein sequences and and map to us. So they are doing protein sequence alignment. Once we have those alignment, we extract the features and then feed those features use into a neural network that uses convolutional neural, uh, neural network and then they can actually fish those features out from map. So what, what sequence alignment usually done is horizontally like that. But uh, what they do is that they flip the features inside out and then go through this by layer. So if you have a string of protein sequences, they, they go through like this and they can extract that this hotspot, 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 hotspot. And those are the point where the proteins, also, sorry, the, the RNA or DNA is gonna bind to the proteins. So by looking at those hotspots and having a reference material in the back, 
that can act, the convolution neural network is very efficiently to be able to extract those features and try to understand why do certain motifs bind together with the certain DNA. So uh, then we can actually go to recurrent neural network. So recurrent neural network, like I say just now, has a memory of a previous step. So in CNN, uh, we don't when they do a motif scan, they don't. I, I'm I'm sure they, they have some. So let's say they don't use any RNN at all in this situation. Uh, they just use CNN. Uh, ATGC they're doing frame by frame. So they don't understand what is happening in the previous frame. So in order for us to actually understand ATG to and a C and to have memory in front or in the back of that sequence, you need an, a recurrent neural network. So similarly, I have also did a, a really long video on RNN tutorial. You can actually go and have a look there. So um, due to its structural characteristics, RNA, RNN is suitable for dealing with long and sequential data, such as DNA array and genomic sequences. Of course, um, this is not absolutely true because we have seen that uh, some CNN would be very useful to, to actually extract the binding site already. But RNN, of course, will be able to perform much better because they have the memory on the front and back. And of course, a lot of thing, a lot of them actually depends on how you um how how you do you put the data into the structure. Because as we always say, rubbish in, rubbish out. And just because you have a good uh, data set doesn't mean the neural network will work. Just because you have the correct just because you're using RNN doesn't mean it will work. There's a lot of um, caveat and, and and funny things on how neural network function, basically. Okay, so uh, the example here is actually uh, using deeper by. So just now it's called uh, deep by. Now it's called deeper by. So what does it? What it does is that uh, similar to the concept just now, this fits this at another LSTM layers. So LSTM is a type of RNN, just in case. Okay, it's a type of RNN. So that LSTM layer will actually capture the, the memory of the frame before and after and also fit that into part of the algorithm for consideration so that it's able to achieve a higher accuracy and a higher um, predictability of things. Of course, it comes at a cost of it's going to be a little bit slower. It's going to be a little bit uh, harder to train and need more computing power because the overall neural network is bigger and LSTM is so slow to train. Even GRU is just much lower compared to um, GRU, uh, compared to CNN and so on. Okay, so the other example here is actually TBI net. So that's actually, that's actually um, a, a bind the binding site for transcription factor. So the um, the concept is actually very similar to what we have just now, which is using uh, DNA and RNA sequences and protein sequences and try to use a uh, combination of CNN plus RNN to actually get a binding site prediction happens. So of course they already have the ground truth, which is why CNN and RNN over here are both supervised learning. Okay, so this is the network structure. They're using a DNA sequence and one, home, one hot encoding means that uh, if it's an A, you have a one in the first row. If it's a C, you would have a one in the third. Sorry, A is the first column, C, T is the second, C is the third column, T is a fourth column and G is a second column and so on. Okay, so this is one hot encoding is also very useful for um, for let's say natural language processing. So this where they are, they are they get their thing on. Okay, so then they fit into a CNN where we run a, a convolution to try to extract the features, and then we run an attention network. These actually transformers. So they are very similar to RNN in terms of the function because they have. Uh, attention means to have the memory of a previous step and then they fit into a BILSTM which stands for bi bidirectional uh, LSTM layers it's just LSTM but you know it goes both direction so they can remember something in front and in the back and then they go to output of a certain uh, of a certain binding site so FC layer means uh, forward convolutional layer no forward layer it's just neural network i'm not too sure what's, what it stands for i'm sure someone will will put it down in the description down in the comments below okay so the next uh, architecture that i want to talk about so we have talked about rn cnn and rnn so today i want to talk about autoencoder so autoencoder is very similar in terms of the normal neural network layer and you can actually use both cnn and rnn inside an autoencoder so what autoencoder is is that the input and the output are usually exactly the same thing. 
So you can fit an image in and then get it scaled down to a smaller number of neurons and then we scale it back up. So one of the, the most um, common or popular example over here is actually fit the image. So this is a 20, this is actually an amnist JPEG. So what it does is that it's a 28 times 28 pixel and with the brightness value. So if we fit this thing into a network and then maybe the first layer will have 64 neurons, the second layer will have four, the third layer will have three, and then we do four and 64 again. So what this essentially do is try to compress the data to the most essential thing that we need. So what happens is that uh, when the data get fits into an OCO encoder, there'll be something called a bottleneck layer. So that bottleneck layer will be the smallest number of neurons among the whole chain. They're usually symmetrical. It means that if it's like six, four, three, it'll be three, four, six. So it's usually symmetrical with this bottleneck in the middle of the layer. So what it essentially does is that it, it can compress a really big data file into four or five value. So it, it's also very useful in terms of data compression where you can really compress a lot of things down to very little numbers and then use an autoencoder model to reconstruct them back. Okay, so uh, what this example here is that uh, we add noise to the input image so that we have an original image and a noisy image and we try to use an autoencoder to throw away all the noises because we, we don't want them. So that what we essentially get is a very clean image and we can actually do this over and over again and we can actually... Um, what, what this is essentially means is that, you know, the denoising you have in your image, this might be one of the functions that you can use. Okay, so yeah, like I say, it's an unsupervised learning technique that actually find representation. It's also very useful for certain feature extraction as well. Okay, so one of the autoencoder in bioinformatics, actually the, the best way to do it is to use it to replace or on, alongside with PCA, Principal Component Analysis. So for those that are not familiar with, um, where do I have? Yeah, so with um, PCA. So PCA, Principal Component Analysis, is try to extract the principal component in a multi-dimensional data. So if you have 20 or 30 different dimensions, you want to compress them down to two or three dimensions, you can actually use PCA as a way to, you know, um, uh, fit the data in a way and a cluster in a way that you can represent a 10 dimensional data in two dimensional platform. So you can, you can think of it like a three dimensional data where you do a little bit of rotation until the rotation is the best where the cluster separates. That's what principal component analysis basically is doing. So, so once we get a concept right, PC is very useful for to, to separate out different genes that belongs to different cells. So in single cell sequencing, uh, let's say you sequence 20, 10 different types of cells. You want to map them onto a 2D graph, like this case, a uh, different type of uh, cell type. So how many cell type are there? Mm, yeah, they didn't say that. One, two, three, four, five, six. About six different types of cell count over here. And you want the best technique to be able to cluster them in a way that you can see all of them. Okay, so PCA is very useful. As you can see that uh, column B, this is the PCA graph. And not just PCA, there's also other technique that you can use, which is actually listed over here. But um, what the autoencoder can also do is to actually um, scale the bottleneck layer down to two dimensions. So if you have a 100,000 dimensional data, go to a bottleneck of two dimension, and then go back to the original dimension, you can actually just look at these two dimensions and plot them on the graph. And this is what you get on the, the, the last um, figure over here. And you can see the separation is actually one of the best compared to uh, UM, UMAP. So the autoencoder and UMAP actually perform ex extremely well. Did I, did my video loss again? Okay, it's back. So uh, they actually perform exceptionally well as compared to more conventional method that we have used. So one of the use for autoencoder, but the, the better thing about encoder, autoencoder is also that it's a much faster method compared to TSNE, uh, PCA, and so on. Depends on the data size and a lot of other things, and you need a training stats and, and so on and so forth. So uh, next week, I'm actually doing an example of autoencoder in R, 
uh, on a much smaller data set. So just subscribe if you want to do that. I don't know. I, I always feel weird asking people to subscribe. Is it weird? Okay, so this is another example, as you can see on eight different types. Uh, so this is another set of single cell sequencing. As you can see, PCA doesn't perform that well. There's a lot of overlapping. And UMAP, even though it's very well, they're a little bit too far apart and we can't really see them. Um, we, we can't really see the detail of them if there's any overlaps and so on. But the autoencoder here do very, very well in terms of not just data separation, but understand like the, the overlapping between the purple and the orange over here. And of course, the autoencoder is subjected to tuning, a training cycle, ventilation cycle, how many kind of uh, layers do you want to put in, what are the neurons in each layer. So not all encoder are, are, are equal in, in that sense because they might, even, even though it might work for them, it might not work for you. Uh, PCA, however, always works. Okay, so similar can be said about, let's say, TS and E, where they, you can change the complexity on it. So on. So let's move on before the video become half an hour long. So the next one I want to talk about is a deep belief network. So this is the complicated one that I do not fully grasp. So if I miss out anything, just let me know. Email me or leave a comment down below or whatever works for you. So uh, a deep belief network is structurally very similar to a multi-layer perceptron. Perceptron. I don't know how to pronounce that word. So it, it's let's say five neurons in and five neurons out and there's new there's uh, neurons in in between that input and output layer but the, the difference is that instead of using a feed forward situation like the normal neural network uh, it actually uses a restricted Boltzmann machine so that in normal neural network the data go one way and it goes all the way and then back propagation happen it goes all the way back okay so that is the normal deep learning network that Everything we'll talk about just now, that is the, the way of how it does that. So um, restricted, Boltzmann net, restricted Boltzmann machine, RBM, is a bit more special in terms that they're, they're, they're training between two layers. So the training happens on, let's say, these two layers. And once it's fixed, this data get updated to the next layer, and they train these two layers, and they get updated again, these two layers, and, and then, and then it, 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 it forms the rest. So instead of thinking up, as a restricted Boltzmann machine, you can also think of it as an autoencoder, where you train these two as an autoencoder independently, and then you train the other two, and then you train the other two, and you train the other two, and you train the other two. So the, the best thing about it is that, uh, unlike a normal feed forward neural network, this one you do not need the end goal first before the training. So of course, you have to train towards something, but you do not need the end to, to train the, the whole network. It can actually work by itself with the data. Okay, uh, Restricted Boltzmann's Machine also wins the Netflix um, competition for movie recommendation. So you can also read a little bit more about that. But but basically, it's, if you really don't care about what is, whatever there's inside, it, it's the same input and output as a, as a multi-level perceptron. It's just a normal neural network for those that don't care about the training. Okay, so this is what I say just now. So there's different layers that you train independently. And you also have an input layer, uh, input data and output data. Okay, so um, this is also using a deep belief network for cancer detection for early intestinal. Let's see if I do anything. Okay, so the input data is actually the, the personal details of each of the patient. What is their age? What is their sex? What is their height? What is their drinking history, smoking history? And then we create a big data table and then we feed that whole data table into a deep belief network and and see on the output and then we predict that which of them would have a higher rate of can higher risk of cancer so you can see this is very similar to a multi-layer percept um i'm just gonna call it deep neural network where you have a visible layer you have a hidden layer and you have an output layer and that will actually have the risk of um different type of either different type of cancer or different type of characteristic of cancer and so on depends on what they have on their hand for now Okay, so we have talked to four different types, uh, convolutional neural network, recurrent neural network, autoencoder, and deep, deep belief network. Um, okay, so this is just one of the really small chunk of uh, uh, machine learning and AI and deep learning network that we have. There's of course a lot more out there that I cannot cover today, but I hope that you all learn something and have a concept of how uh, this kind of thing works. And if you have any questions, just leave a comment down below. And and email me if you have any further questions. I'd love to reply to those. <laughs> Bye.